Okay, well, morning, 25th of October, and we're still in lockdown, but we are here together, and we're looking at the God's Word, and just going to ask the Lord for help as we look at the Scriptures. Uh, we are conscious, Lord, that we need to hear your voice. Uh, you've said that if we don't hear your voice, we will not live, because man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so we are asking <clears throat> this morning, Lord, as part of that ongoing revelation that we will have the full counsel of God in this place. And this morning, Lord, we will hear your voice in a very real way. Amen. So I'm reading, you will know, the prayer of Jabez uh, in 1 Chronicles 4, verses 9 and 10. Jabez was more honourable than his brethren, and his mother called his name <coughs> Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, and that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. God answers prayer, doesn't he? He answers prayer. And we don't know anything about this man apart from the little bit of background that we're given here, whether she had a difficult birth, we do, the family circumstances, we don't know. But she bore him in sorrow. And um, he was more honourable than his brethren. I was thinking about this because are we honourable? Well, in the world's eyes, we certainly are not. We're non-entities. I'm a non-entity my proper status but you know when I, as I was thinking about this I remember when I was in Kampala at the prayer mountain and you see Africa has a different sky to England you see this fabulous black sky with thousands of stars and maybe God looks down on this world it's black blind foolish wicked world in its darkness and he sees here and there blazing lights. Those who have the righteousness of Christ. And it's not that they are honourable uh, because of some personal goodness or status. It is entirely that the, the way they shine as honourable beings is entirely down to this. The extent to which they are truly in Christ. In Christ. It's a good expression. Paul spoke of some. He said they were in Christ before me. And I just put that out to you right now. Are you truly in Christ? In Christ. His prayer is very specific. Jabez. It's very direct. And it's very proud. It's very powerful. And can I say this, if there's ever a time, I suppose every preacher in every generation has said the same thing, but if there was ever a time when we as God's people ought to be praying seriously with determination and faith and real effect, it is now. It is now. Um, specific, direct, powerful, and we are to pray like that. Ask but think beforehand. Weigh things up. Get into a godly motivation. Don't do that. Don't be imprecise. Don't be vague. Go to God in the way that Jabez has gone to God. Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. I want to be blessed. Enlarge my coast. That your hand would be with me. I want your hand with me. Do you feel that? I want that. I want God's hand with me. Maybe more than anything in a way. That you would keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. Evil can be so grievous. That's the right word, isn't it? And he, but don't go there now, but in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, when Paul is talking about the terrible sin that's been in the church, he's had to deal with it, and he thinks about the repentance, thank God, that had happened, and the depths and the depth and the reality of that repentance. And he speaks about two kinds of sorrow. He says, godly sorrow works repentance. 
not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world works death. There's an evil that will cause you to grieve and take away hope and put out the light and set you apart and take you on that terrible journey into eternal darkness. There's, there's, there's an evil that is like that. We're the Lord Jesus said, when you pray, pray among other things. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And he's asking for that very precisely. We should pray precisely. Let's go to God meaning what we say because we are moved by the urgency of the hour, the situation that we are in personally and collectively, our nation, our families, our churches. Precise, determined praying. And, he, and he's asking. And the things he's asking for, blessing, enlargement, God's hand to be with him. Now, I, all of that stupid, phony Christianity where I, Lord, I'm asking for a Rolls Royce, I want a mansion with a swimming pool. Well, why don't you go and ask your real God, Mammon, if that's what you're after? Yeah. Go and ask, and ask that God. And when you get to that church, Laodicea, the last of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 3, where they are materialistic, materialistically well off, they've got everything. We have need, they say it, we have, this is their inner deliberation. We have need of nothing. We've arrived. And the Lord says, you are blind, you are naked, you are miserable. And my, and my advice to you is get some real gold. Gold tried in the fire. Faith that has stood the test and brings you to God. Get something really valuable. Don't pray for a new car. Pray that God will give you that gold. And be precise about it. Lord, I want faith that's real, that's been tested, that will stand against anything because it's you and it's brought me to you. Let's pray precise deliberate, serious prayers. Now he asks for these things. He wants blessing. He wants enlargement. He wants God's presence. And he wants to be kept from that kind of evil that really grieves. Now I don't know whether he knew uh, that God was going to give him those things. God did give him those things. Um, did he pray with a confidence that he's going to be heard? I don't know. He was heard. And it's a great truth, isn't it, that God answers prayer. He hears and he answers prayer. Anthony shared from 1 John 5, don't go there now, but uh, this morning, a fabulous verse 20, wonderful verse. I'm half thinking it might be a good verse for November, but we'll see. I've got another one in mind, but that might, that might do better. And let's ask God. We want the right word, don't we? Month after month, we want to hear something from God. Um, but in that same chapter, you've got that remarkable, it's verses 14 and 15. Just, we know that if we ask anything according to his will, that's a very big um, qualifying truth, he will hear and he will grant our request. There it is in black and white, God's word. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, if you want to check it out. Now, we are in a different time to Jabez, and I hope that we can sense that and, and actually rejoice in it. Um, we have riches in Christ that are wonderful beyond measure. They're wonderful beyond measure. Enlargement of land and, uh, you know, being... Um, kept from evil, yeah, but, but the, the, the riches in Christ, the spiritual fullness that is in Christ. And I want to look at that fairly briefly, but with some deliberation this morning. Um, it, it, it is said, and it's, there's a lot of truth in it, the, the, the sign of blessing in the Old Testament was prosperity. Adam, uh, Abraham was very rich, as was Isaac, and so on. It's also said, maybe not quite so comfortably, but with absolute accuracy, that the sign of blessing for the New Testament believer is adversity. Yes, it is. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. 
and we are to rejoice. James says it, when you get troubles and difficulties and trials that, that stretch you so you will take hold of God, thank God for them. That's the sign of blessing for the New Testament believer. But it, although it's said that yeah, natural ma uh, material prosperity was a sign of blessing in the Old, Old Testament, actually they did have some very hard times. I'm thinking especially of God's servants. Again, I, don't want, I want to look at Ezekiel 33, please. But almost all of those prophets, you can immediately think of the, the trials that those men and women, Deborah was a great prophetess, wasn't she? The trials they went through. They went through. Jeremiah, he's put in a deep, dark, dirty dungeon up to his neck in slime. And they would have let him die there of starvation. And it, but Barak, was it Barak who rescued him? But the worst thing for Jeremiah was the grief. When you read Lamentations, his heartache, because God has done what was threatened, and he tried to tell them, he tried to tell them, and they wouldn't listen. Hosea, my goodness. He is told to marry a woman who's little more than a prostitute. I think she became a prostitute, a serial cheater. Imagine being told by God, marry that woman, she will cheat on you all the time. It's not a very comfortable relationship, is it? But he was, he, he was going to have to feel, which every real preacher and teacher has to feel what God is saying. He was going to feel God's agony at the unfaithfulness of Israel. That's what was behind it, and it comes right in the end. Ezekiel, my goodness me. He has a young wife he adores. And the Lord says, she will die tonight, don't even cry. What about that? You adore her, she's your treasure. I'm taking her from you, don't even cry. And then the worst thing in in a preacher's life, and it's the, what every preacher fears and sadly comes true all the time, that they will hear and know God has spoken, but they will not act. And at the end of um, chapter 33 of Ezekiel, you get this, don't you, where, <clears throat> I mean, verse 31, <clears throat> well, actually 30, <clears throat> Son of man, the children of thy people are still talking against you by the wards and the doors of the houses. Well, as a priest, you learn not to worry about people talking against you. I'll never forget the time <laughs> I preached somewhere. I can't remember where it was now. And uh, the guy came up to me and said, I, um, I really liked your ministry, but I've been told you're a false prophet. Well, thanks for that. <laughs> mm. And the reason was, he says, you don't believe people should marry. I what? I, I wish we had a wedding in Stroud Green every month. I'd, I'd love it. I said, where did you get that from? I ignored it. Um, I figured out where the source of it was. They speak against you, preacher. But they say this, come I pray you. <clears throat> Hear what's the word of, that comes from the Lord. And they come to you and the people, verse 31, they sit before you as my people. They hear your words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. Oh, the talk's good. Praise the Lord, they say. But their heart goeth after their covetousness. They love something more than you. Idolatry is covetous. Covetousness is idolatry, isn't it? We're told that, covetousness, which is idolatry. You have another God. It might be anything, your business career, your sports, whatever, your, anything. But you love it more, in truth, you love it more than the God who made you. And lo, thou art to them as a very lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice. You can play well on an instrument. You really put it across, Ezekiel. And they hear thy words, but they do them not. 
And when this comes to pass, lo, it will come. Then they'll know that a prophet has been among them. God will have the last word. Whether they respond in any depth or not, or whether they just like what they hear for a moment and it doesn't change anything, they will know this. God did speak to them. That word was real. It was true. It did matter. They should have responded. They should have taken it on board with all their heart. And, and it, it's a terrible thing to suffer that, isn't it? Now, Hebrews 11, please, um, again, on the same subject that the people in the Old Testament did suffer. And um, just try and move on a bit more quickly. But Hebrews 11, just to pick that up. Verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms. They wrought righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. Escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. I love that. Out of weakness were made strong. You're weak, God can make you strong. Waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yet moreover of bonds, imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. I think, I think that's how Isaiah died. I think they cut him in half. I think they sawed him in half. They were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, in mountains, in dens, in caves of the earth. All these, and can you, can you reflect on this? This is my real point. All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Their dispensation was not as good as ours. Verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now, we have more than the believers of old did because we have Christ. That's the, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. But we need to know what God has given us. And if you go to Ephesians 1, and a good part of what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus, which in many ways was an excellent church, it, it was to this end that they would understand just how much God had given them in Christ. And then by faith enter into it. I'm just, I, really, you could read the whole of chapter, well, the latter, latter parts of chapters 1 and 3, but I don't want to do that. That will take too much time. But I'm picking out just a couple of things. Verse 13 of chapter 1, Ephesians 1. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Salvation. Your salvation. The assurance of salvation. That which Christ has given, that deep inner certainty that I am washed in the blood of Jesus, my name is in the book of life, I belong to God. I was a vile sinner that has changed beyond measure. And I have this. And it's been sealed by the Holy Spirit. After you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The seal of the Spirit, that priceless treasure that is the inheritance of all God's children. Because Christ has ascended. Remember in the last day of the feast, don't go there, but John 7, and he stood and cried, If any man thirst, come to me and drink. Out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. When I drink of God in that way, something comes out of me that is supernatural. And this spake he, I'm quoting from John 7 verse 38, This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed were to receive. But he was not yet given, because that Christ was not yet ascended. And the woman at the well, she could have had the water of life straight away. He says to her, if you knew it was of speaking to you, you would have asked. And he would have given you that living water that springs up as a well of life. But this was what was to come at Pentecost, after Christ had ascended. And they waited, and the Spirit came. 
What a blessing. Verses 22, 20, I mean, Ephesians 1 still. He's put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things which, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. The glory of the church, the glory of the church, to be in Christ and in his body. It is the best thing in the world. Nothing is like it, friends. Nothing. There's no earthly association, any ultra super club. Nothing is like it to be in the body of Christ. Chapter 3, um, there's so much, and you, it's worth looking at. Well, I would say um, from verse 13 to 23 of chapter 1, and then in chapter 3, which please just go to, I'm in Ephesians still. Um, really from verse 7 to the end, I would say. But anyway, um, verse 16 of chapter 3, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his grace, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. An inner strength that comes from God. We have that. That's our inheritance. Jabez asked for those things. We have. We, we've got everything. We have to enter into it by faith. We have to realise it and enter in by faith. And then you get back to prayer because um, in verse 14, Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know what's happened to you at Ephesus. You have the real gospel. You have the real Jesus. You're in Christ. But you need to know. You need to gain that ground that God has given you in Christ. And I know the key to that, says Paul, impliedly, is for me to pray. And verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Do you have Christ dwelling in your heart? Important question, isn't it? Christ within the hope of glory. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that's able to do, this is a great verse, isn't it? Well, think of the best thing spiritually that you would desire. Think of it. God will do more than that. That's what it's saying, isn't it? To him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Praise God. Well, Jabez prayed. And I'm going back to my text and coming to a conclusion. He was more honourable than his brethren. We are honourable for one reason. And one only. As, as heaven sees the human race and those that are honourable. Because we are in Christ. We have the honour that comes through him. The righteousness which is of faith in Christ. And he calls on God. Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. Enlarge my coast, that your hand might be with me. You would keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. God has given us everything in Christ. And may we really, by his grace, and by prayer, it's, it, it, prayer is the key to all of it, isn't it? And he prays, and let's do the same thing. You know, that, that, um, that direct, specific, powerful asking, preparing my heart, telling God, getting into his presence, being real, not dithering, not letting my mind wander, engaging with God because he's ready to give us everything. He's already given it to us in Christ, but he's ready to make it a reality. So may we seek his face. Thank you.